So AMC crushed it with 20% up and now people like Charles Payne and the S3 managing director are now talking about it. But what exactly does this have to do with why AMC went up and why margin calls are likely going to be happening. Because we are not only taking a look at data as early as 1937, but we are going to understand why this is now probably the most tumultuous time in the market for margin calls and why we are gonna start right now. So what exactly is up, guys? My name is Andrew, that is Professor Meatball, and we are looking at the bear market already in progress. But what exactly is a bear market? How exactly can you avoid getting hurt in it? And why exactly is that like button the most important thing to demolish on your way in and watch until the end. Comment at which like you guys are all the way up to 1200 and let's get to it. The bear market of 2022 has eerily similar characteristics of bear markets in the past. The 2022 bear market looks very similar to 1937, 2000, and 2008. If the bear markets are similar, the 2022 version is nearing the most dangerous phase. But first, let's start with 19. After rallying from March 1935 to March 1937, the S&P 500 dropped sharply until the summer of 1937 by nearly 19%. That was when the index saw a solid summer rally, which lifted the S&P 500 more than 14% off its lows, peaking around August 20, 1937. Following that summer rally, the market fell sharply nearly 70% between September 1937 and April 1938. Using a 31,000-day offset to overlay the S&P 500 of today versus the bear market, we can see the S&P 500 of today has plotted a very similar course to that of 1937. It would suggest that S&P 500 of today is likely to be hitting an inflection point in the next couple of weeks. It could result in a recent 2022 rally continuing, the comparison with 1937 no longer working, or S&P 500 of 2022 turning sharp sharply lower as the market did in 1937. Already seeing a lot of that historic data compiling and compounding into bad news. But the bad news then turns into good news for retail investors when people have shorted the market to oblivion they are then going to be in a ton of debt, a ton of liability that they probably cannot maintain if the rest of their markets crash. For example, the index funds, the, the large ETFs, everything that is a big pot of stocks, if they all start to go down, margin calls are inevitable. Let's look at 2000. The bear market that started in the year 2000 also shares many of same of the same properties of S&P 500 of today. In this case, using a 7,874 day offset, the two charts will line up. Following the 1998 sell-off, the S&P 500 rallied sharply until 2000. The S&P 500 of 2000 was more resilient at first, retesting its March 2000 highs again in September 2000. After that, the index saw a pronounced sell-off following a January 2001 rally. That January 2001 rally marked the final rebound, followed by a nearly 20% decline into April 20, 2001. So again, the market of today is in the same point in line. So therefore, if the S&P 500 is going to turn lower and follow the path of 2000, that sharp decline could happen over the next couple of weeks. Now, let's take, take a look at everyone's favorite, 2008. Finally, the bear market of 2008 seems to match the S&P 500 of 2022 most closely. A 5,218-day offset aligns the double bottom in the fall of 2020 up with the double bottom in the spring of 2006. Like the two previous bear markets examples, after peaking in October 2007, the S&P 500 went lower on a slow and steady decline of nearly 19%. That was followed by a rally in the spring of 2008, which then led a gain of almost 12%. Of course, after that rally, the S&P 500 again found itself turning lower, erasing the spring gains. And so finally, let's do a little bit of synthesis. What exactly are the similarities and what do we have to understand from this? The declines may differ in each of these cases, but it isn't the reason why it matters. It is the patterns that market follow that matter. When overlaying 1937, 2000, 2008 altogether on one chart, they show that the bull rally phases had nearly the same duration. And that's very important. You can make money but only until there's critical mass of bears. With all peaking within six month time frame, followed by a sharp decline, a very sharp counter trend rally, followed by a significantly steeper decline. Does this mean that the market of 2022 has to follow the same path? No. It does not. But if the bear market we are living in and the pattern continues, the market may be entering the most dangerous part of the bear market, the part where a powerful rally catches everyone off guard and is followed by a sharp and sudden decline. 
lot of people consider this a dead cat, but I consider it as dead hedgies because they are likely not going to be able to survive it. So let's take a look at what Charles Payne is saying. We're going to make sure that we watch him from the beginning because he is going to talk about the AMC preferred shares, the AMC preferred uh, uh, ape stock. And now we're going to be able to pay attention to why exactly is that so important. Hold on a second. <laughs> we're going to take a look right now. And boom. Hold on. We're going to take a look right. If you guys haven't yet hit that subscribe button, it's a pretty good time to do it. And it will make it be pretty much worth your day. Let's take a look. One, two. I'm going to make the audio come from somewhere else. Three. All right. So, <clears throat> sorry. It's been a down year, and we know <clears throat> in short sell nice. as well. Let's just say they were really laying it on thick in the second quarter of the year. But then something really interesting happened in June. The tables turned and the market began to rebound. And, well, you know, it was a great July for the overall market. It was a monster, monster July for shorted names. The most shorted names have outperformed big time. And I think maybe this could be the start of a major sea shift. Listen, it's been an epic battle for the last several years between its shorts and mostly retail investors. Joining me now is the Managing Director of Predictive Analytics at S3 Partners, Igor Dusaniski. And Igor, you know, all week long, I, I heard, I did a, I did segments on this this week. And, and, and one name that kept coming up was Bed Bath to be on the next big short squeeze, up 25% today. A lot of these heavily shorted names are up huge. And we see this happen a lot, Beyond Meat, for instance. They seem to take on, these, these periods seem to take on a life of their own. Listen, I'm looking at Groupon, I, I'm looking at Big Lots, Intercept Pharmaceuticals, these kind of names. How does that happen, though? Is this also, this can't all be retail, right? When this starts to happen, do you see speculative hedge funds and others getting involved? Absolutely. I, when you look at the volumes that, that we see on the short side of the market, it's nowhere near what a retail investor or retail investors can do. When you've got uh, you know, $14 billion of shorts in Apple, uh, you know, $17 billion of shorts in Tesla, this is not a retail trade. This is an institutional trade. You know, the battle between the longs and the shorts in many ways reminds me uh, of the Battle of Troy, right? Epic shifts, massive losses, the, uh, you know, the determination on both sides. And, of course, you know the old saying, right? The, one of the first things I heard on Wall Street was the shorts go out on the shields. Why is it so intense? You know, the short side is really important to the market. It provides liquidity. It provides a hedge to your long, long book. And remember, hedge funds are you know, levered big time. So we're not talking about a small amount of short sales. They're, they're shorting anywhere from 30 to 60% of their NAV, and there's a lot of activity there in order to buy some protection for your long side of your book. So they're going in and out of names on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of uh, discussion about how some of these shorts are put on, uh, you know, how you can be short over 100% of the float, those kind of things. Yeah. <laughs> and it, there, there are people, and, and I happen to be in this camp, that think there are ways of, of the gaming the system, right? And it feels like one of the problems is that there are ways you can get trades never settling. They never settle, and somehow that's how you can create these synthetic short positions. I bring that up because AMC issuing a special uh, dividend, comes. if you will, the ape share, convertible into common stock. And one of the goals, I think, is to somehow flush out these synthetic shorts. Can that work? All right. There's a little bit of misnomer what is what considered a synthetic short. Every time someone shorts a share, you're actually creating a long stock. You've got the guy that went stock to, to the short seller. The short seller sells it, and there's a buyer of that stock. So you've got two longs for every short sale. And that's how you get uh, over 100% short interest pledge of float when you use a traditional uh, calculation. We actually created S3 short interest pledge of float, which takes that into account. So you've got the numbers that are always below 100%. So the idea that uh, there's all these synthetic shares floating around is, is, is not quite you know, where, where, uh, where people think it is. Uh, but this AFC trade is going to be interesting because it's going to create some uh, extra liquidity in the market if and when uh, Aaron uh, you know, does want to issue more shares. But in the meantime, you know, before these, uh, this uh, uh, you know, stock dividend or stock split comes out, uh, there's going to be a little bit of turmoil in the market, and I think there's going to be a volatility and, and a lot of buy pressure for shorts getting out of the market before these stocks get issued. Oh, okay. All right, so that might explain the, the sharp reversal today. Hey, I've got less than a minute to go. What is your thoughts on, on regulators? Should they do anything more, you know, bring back the uptick rule, bring, you know, bring some opaqueness, to remove some of the opaqueness, the dark pools, those sort of things? Could they, please? I mean, that's what we do at S3. It's really trying to bring some color, some clarity to this opaque market. More data is good, good for the market. It's good for retail guys. It's good for institutional guys. And we really try to 
give more information to to the you know the market players guys buying go buying long buying short a long seller wants to know what's on the short side the short guy wants to know what's going on in the short side you don't want to be in a crowded short you don't want to be in a stock that's got a squeeze uh, possibility so the more information you get the better you are and that's why we created a short you know a short uh, crowded and short mm -hmm. squeeze score in our blackout mm -hmm. it helps the uh, helps both sides of the market it really does. I, I really appreciate your work. It is fantastic. You are, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. And I appreciate you, Thanks Charles you. Payne. Thank you for being part of this uh, big, big deal. It's a big deal to be able to be part of making history. So that's why I commend you guys for reaching this part of the video where I tell you that we're going to do giveaways. So comment down below when you think my musical is going to go up in October. I'll just give you the month right away because I'm composing, I'm a playwright, I'm creating in this space, and I'm someone who also just loves the stock. So if you guys think that that's a good way to be able to get involved with the channel, then please do get access to the six-figure portfolio by pressing that join button next to the subscribe button, which all of you have already pressed. And if you guys like this content, please do leave it a like for Professor Meatball's sake, and I will see every single one of you in the money. Peace.